So good to see everybody out here. Good morning, Rachel. Hi, Amy. Happy Sabbath, everyone. So, as you probably all know, the queen passed away. The queen of the country that we revolted from passed away. Um, but, sorry, the queen of England passed. And um, they're certainly mourning her passing. And I heard something interesting the other day about her. It uh, was a news article and it said she visited with President Obama, she visited with President Trump, and you never knew if she liked or disliked either one of them. And somebody said, and that's the point of being the queen, right? Because she treated everyone with respect, she treated everyone the same, and was a unifying force, and a consistent and a loyal force. So I think there's great honor in that. And in fact, no matter how we act, no matter how we fail, no matter how great we are or how not great we are, God loves us the same and treats us the same and invites us the same and forgives us just the same. So I think there are lessons to be learned from the queen that are also important for us. And uh, it's good to see each one of you this morning. Let's take a few minutes and greet one another. Hello. Oh, there I am. Hi. How are you guys doing? Good? No, no, no. How are you guys doing? Great? You can say not great. That's okay. But that's why we're here, right? We're all here because we're not perfect. We don't have everything together, but we got friends and we have family. And we got a great place to worship together. So uh, our first song is not The Stand. <laughs> It's uh, the other song, sorry. So, uh, one second everyone, we'll be good. <laughs> All right, so uh, anybody have any good stories this week that you wanna tell? The first song is Lord I Need You.
Shall we kneel for a prayer? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you are truly the one who gave it all. We can not, on, not even begin to understand what that means. But because of you, we have the opportunity for salvation. Because of you, we experience all the good things that we experience in this world. Because of you, we see still beauty and wonder in this world. And Lord, we want to request today that you come and be with us here, that your spirit will cleanse us and forgive us, that you will bless us with uh, your presence so that we may not be just uh, doing something here that has no meaning, but that it will have meaning because of the presence of the God of the universe. Lord, we want to praise you for all that you do in this world, that you've brought us through another week, that you've brought us hopefully safely through the pandemic and through the difficulties that were attending it. You've brought us thus far in our journey and you have wonderful things in store even though we maybe can't see it or sometimes don't realize it. Lord, we want to call upon you to Forgive us and cleanse us from our sins and mistakes. Lord, we are like sheep that are going astray and we uh, do things that we shouldn't have done. We've said things that we shouldn't have said. And Lord, we need your cleansing and forgiveness to cover us. Lord, we want to dedicate our lives and our experience to you. We want like the... uh, song we just sang to that our hearts and minds will be emptied of everything except a consecration and surrender to you that you may direct our steps and our path that we may not uh, seek to run ahead of you or neglect and uh, fall behind you but that may that we may walk with you hand in hand so that we will be at the right place and the right time with your spirit and with your leading Lord, we want to ask that you be with uh, our church here and with our nation, with the difficulties that we are facing. We also think of the nation of England, Lord. We pray that you give the people there comfort as they've just recently lost their queen and other nations, Lord, the nations of this world, the troubles that we see going on, the war in Ukraine and other things. We just pray, Lord, that you will take things into your uh, hands and that you will overrule for your own honor and glory. We also, Lord, uh, want to specifically ask for prayer requests here in our church. Lord, there are people that are going through difficulties and I don't have the names of everyone, but you certainly know those that are going through challenges, maybe financial or health-wise or others. Or Lord, some are soon to have babies or have just had babies. Lord, we pray that you'll bless them as well. Pray that your spirit will be with all those that are here in our church and with those that are not here with us today and those that have maybe backslid. We pray that your spirit will reach out to them and draw them back to you. Lord, we want to ask, especially today, that you be with Mel and please bless him as he shares the message with us. Guide him with your spirit. And Lord, we want to uh, just dedicate ourselves to you and we ask that your spirit and your direction will be here with our service today. Thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you that you have blessed us this week and you will bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning again, everyone. So Mary, there was a 
Birthday this week, I understand, is that true? Christy Joe's birthday, yesterday? Did you have a party for her or anything like that? Ah, she went to visit Chase. So that's probably a very good birthday for her, I think, a birthday celebration. Please wish her well, tell her that we all said happy birthday. Um, and we'll be praying for Chase. Everybody in a high school needs prayers, so keep everyone in the high school years in our prayers. Um, we have a little bit of business to do in addition to a few announcements. Um, you will note if you have read your bulletin already that there are several second readings on membership transfers. And so I'd like to present those to the church now. Uh, the Gillilands, second reading, Denise and John, Isabel and Milena Gilliland have transferred or re requested their transfer to the Bakersfield Hillcrest Church in California, Bakersfield, California. So it's a bit of a long commute for them, so they decided to transfer their membership. And also, Trisha Lee Roll, also formerly known as Trisha Lee Wilkins, is transferring her membership as well. Her second reading is in the bulletin. She's transferring to the Far West and SDA Church, which is just north and west of Richmond uh, in Rockville, Virginia. Did you know there was a Rockville, Virginia? I didn't either. Is that a misprint? She going to the Rockville, Maryland church? Rockville, Virginia. I looked it up. It's just a little north and west of Richmond. So they have requested transfer so they can drive a little less distance on Sabbath mornings and uh, there's been a second reading. So all in favor of the requested transfer of these folks to their respective churches. Thank you. Any opposed? For me, just a show. We wish they were here, but that has passed. So the transfers have been granted. I want to bring your attention to a few items also coming up here in our church very soon. On the 20th, Tuesday the 20th, there will be a church board meeting on Tuesday night, September 20th. Also coming up on September 24th, Sabbath evening, there will be a game night, another game night. It will start right around sunset, around 6.30ish. There will be a Vespers and then there will be food and there will be games as well. So please mark that in your calendar. And in addition, coming up next month will be the church retreat. Anybody know where that's being held this year? Anybody? You can't vote? Levi, where will it be held? Mount Etna, that is correct. Good job, it's a day retreat. So we'll just be traveling there for the day, but there will still be lots of fun things to do, the nature center, the hike, the service, and great fellowship and food as well. So I hope you can attend that. The email with the information for that went out last night. So you should have received that if you haven't checked it yet or don't have it yet. Um, let Mena know and she'll send it to you directly. Our special budget uh, offering giving this week is to the World Budget for Radio Ministries. So if you are wanting to support that special ministry in the church, please mark your check and you can put it in the back after the service or you can give directly to that online at our website. And I do also want to remind you that we're still in a bit of a deficit on our local church budget, so please continue to give toward that so we can continue to support the awesome AV that we have and the continued uh, heat and cool in the building and all of those good things. So please give to that as well. And finally, uh, I just wanted to remind you, if you've noticed in your bulletin, our good friend, Elder, um, Emeritus Mel Carino will be giving the word to us today. So we're very, very much looking forward to that. He's not here or I would have made fun of him a little bit, but um, Mel is a man of God. And I know that he has something special for us today. The name of the sermon is Praying for Rain. So I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this home that you have given us. 
We thank you for this fellowship that you have given us. We thank you for the family that surrounds us. And Lord, we are just grateful, grateful, grateful for the mercy and love and forgiveness that you share with us constantly, no matter what. You are always there. You will always be there. You're always looking out for us, how good or bad we may be. And Lord, we are just grateful for that everlasting love. Lord, help us to share that with others. Help us to be able to be big enough to be kind and thoughtful and forgiving even when we're having a bad day. Lord, we just ask that you will bless us and help us to keep focused on you so that we can be good representatives of you and pass that love on to others. Lord, we thank you for the ability that we have to give, however large or small it may be. Please bless the offerings that we are about to give, Lord. And Lord, finally, we ask that you will be with our speaker, be with Mel, guide his words, and open our hearts to receive them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Wishing for a mother Rai is a boy who wished for a mother. Sadly, Raya's mother died when he was just seven years old in Brodowski, Brazil. Rai was left with his father. Rai loved father very much. But sometimes it was difficult for the little boy to live alone with a big, strong man and no gentle, caring mother. Rai had to learn to take care of himself. His father was old and busy and did not have time to teach him many things. Rai missed the love and care of his mother. Then Rai got a new mother. Father found a new wife and got married. But, sadly, just a year later, Rai's new mother also died. Rai was a sad boy. It seemed like he would never have a mother again. Then Rai became a pathfinder. Someone told him about the Pathfinder Club at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he decided to become a member. Rai enjoyed participating in Pathfinder activities with the other children. He loved listening to stories about Jesus. He found new friends whom he could count on, and he gave his heart to Jesus. But Rai's heart still ached. He longed for a mother. As Rai spent time with the Pathfinders, He formed a special friendship with the director of the Pathfinder Club, a big, strong man named Mr. Alexander. Rai especially liked Mr. Alexander's wife, Mrs. Claudian. He decided that she would be his new mother. Mrs. Claudian felt a mother's love for Rai, and she accepted him as her son. Mr. Alexander and Mrs. Claudian already had two young children, Joao Pedro and Ana Clara, they accepted Rai as their new brother. Little by little, the new family lovingly welcomed Rai into their home. He became the eldest son, with his own room, closet, and clothes. He even got braces for his crooked teeth, which was his dream. Today, Rai still lives with father and loves him very much. His new family taught him the importance of keeping the fifth commandment, which says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Exodus 20.12 Therefore, Rai takes turns living with father and with his new family. Father, who is quite old now, is happy that Rai has a new family. He knows that God gave the new family to Rai so Rai could receive the care that he couldn't provide. Today, Rai loves God with all his heart. Through the Pathfinders, God fulfilled the wish. He is a boy with a new mother, and much more. He has a new family. Part of the 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will help open a new church in Rai's hometown of Brodowski. A new church in another part of the city will provide an opportunity to open another Pathfinder club where even more children can learn about Jesus. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. May God add blessings to his 
read out this word. Can you hear me? I liked your reading, Nathan. I want you up here a lot more often. One day pretty soon, you won't need this. But for right now, we enjoy the fact that you get to use it. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Remember when you walked into these doors, you could leave your concerns and your worries outside this building. Did you remember that? Some of you are sitting here right now in pews, distraught, concerned, worried about the giants that you're facing in your life. This is a safe place. This is where God wants you to be right now to experience security that comes only in him and through him. Treasure that. Don't be dismayed. Yes, in this world you will have many troubles, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Last week, Pastor Felder used Matthew 25 and stole a little bit of what I was planning on doing this week when he shared with you the, uh, the parable of the, the ten virgins. And I'm going to rehash a little bit because there's just one little part at the very end that I want to make sure we don't miss before we get into the message of today. The virgins he correctly termed are also or could be known today as bridesmaids. Okay, so you think about it a little bit more in today's vernacular. You remember the story, there's 10 virgins, they're preparing for this incredible wedding. It was a big deal, big shindig, as some people would say. And there were 10 of them, but it was supposed to begin at a certain time. A certain time, a planned time. Everybody was banking on it happening at a certain time in a certain way. And don't we often do that in our life? We plan things just a certain way. And when things go a little bit askew, we stress. And sometimes we find ourselves unprepared. Um, Hi, Lou, I remember your wedding. I remember that day. I remember that we were all sitting in church waiting for that beautiful bride of yours. Probably nobody more impatiently than you. There was a set time that that wedding was to take place. Two and a half hours later, beautiful, lovely, stressed Abnet showed up. I could see in Hailu one of these moments. But you had prepared for a time. By the way, this is my favorite part of the whole story. Okay, we were all much younger then. But I teased Abnet the day before. I came up to you right after Sabbath school and I said, Abnet, you know, there's a history with Ethiopian weddings, they always run late. She says, no, not my wedding. We are starting on time. I'm gonna change all that and we are starting on time. Am I picking on you too much? The hardest job I had was to keep Fred sitting at that organ. He had someplace else he had to go. He says, Mel, I gotta go, I gotta go. I said, you're not leaving until that processional takes place. So I had to pull him back to stay for the processional. But you understand how things can change when you make plans and the plans that you make don't transpire the way you would want them to. So these 10 bridesmaids were preparing for what they, I'm sure, expected was to be an afternoon wedding. But think back X many thousands of years ago, there's no flip of a light switch. The wedding delayed, it became dark. And as the Bible tells us the story, everybody fell asleep. All the bridesmaids fell asleep. And then word got out that the groom was nearing. They all woke up and they recognized we've got to go out to meet them. But only five 
had put enough oil in their lantern so that they could go out to meet. The other five did not. They were unprepared for that delay. So the five that had that say, hey, you guys, we can't give you any of ours or we're gonna run out. Why don't you go get some and then come right back? And that's what they did. And they came back to a procession that had already started. Have you ever been to a church where there's only one way in and one way out and there are two big doors and there's no glass windows and you've got to knock on that door to get in? Well, can you imagine that they did? They knocked on that door thinking we were invited to this wedding. We were supposed to be a part of this wedding, but we didn't plan ahead. We had to go and now we're here and it's late. And the groom is the one that answers the door. And the groom said, I don't know why you're here, but I don't know you. You can't come in. That's the story of the the virgins. In fact, the quote is, truly I tell you that I cannot let you in for I don't know who you are. This story tells us about the critical importance of preparation. And that's gonna be the central message I'm trying to share with us today. But something more needs to be said about that parable before we gloss over it and get into where we're going. I would be totally remiss if I didn't share this. A very exceptional pastor uh, of mine and that pastored in this church for some while, um, Richard Fredericks, said one time that if during any sermon the gospel of Christ is somewhere not preached, not shared to people in the audience, it was a wasted sermon. So I'd like to share something with you about that parable that you may know, but you may not. Everyone is invited to the wedding. Everyone has a ticket that has been paid for at no small cost. In fact, at a cost that we cannot pay. That wedding was not, for some of you older timers, the wedding of the century. Remember what that was? Andy was just talking about England earlier. The wedding of the century, some of us got up at five o'clock or some unreasonable hour to watch Princess Diana marry Prince Charles in 1981, many, many moons ago. And that was termed the wedding of the century. But we're not talking about that wedding. We know how that turned out, very sadly. We're talking about the wedding of all history. The term history only happens on a timeline. And as humans, we live on a timeline. Outside of the fallen state of man in worlds that we do not yet know, there is no timeline. There is no such thing. Why? Because time is perpetual. It's infinite. It doesn't end. So the wedding that we're invited to is the wedding of all eternity. It's the wedding of all history. It's the wedding that starts the beginning of eternity for all of us who are willing to attend. In the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our ticket was bought. But there is one requirement for us to be at that wedding. And that's that we have to accept the invitation ticket and we have to accept the invitation ticket giver. Two things. Acts 16, 30 and 31, and if I had more time, I'd go into it, but it's the great story of Paul and Silas in prison, right? And what happens with the earthquake? I mean, come on, guys, this is a great sermon. The jailer was so upset at what had taken place and he thought everybody had left. He's just about to do himself in. And then he hears the voice of Paul saying, stop. Right? This is almost like an Isaac, Abraham and Isaac story. Stop. We're right here. Don't do anything. 
and they share the story about how everything is okay. We're all in our place. And this man can't believe it. He was ready to take his own life at that moment. And their sharing of the story was so winsome because of how they carried themselves even in the prison of their life, even in the time of their captivity. And I'm not just saying literal, we all have those moments where we're prisoners to circumstances in our life, where we are held captive in places we do not wish to be. But in how they deported themselves, During that time, that man saw something. That jailer saw something unique that he had never seen before. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And here's the response. Believe the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Wow. One ticket, good for all. That's pretty, this is scripture. I'm not making this up. Don't forget what has been read. Romans 9, 10, Paul then fleshes this out a little bit. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We tend to add too much to the salvation story. Sometimes so much that we get inundated Maybe it's the legalism. Maybe it's the do's and don'ts of denominationalism. By the way, never forget, there's no denominations in heaven. Whatever it is, we can impose the same thing upon ourselves that the Jewish leaders did to the people during the time of the Exodus and prior. Paul goes on to say, for with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So it's a mental ascent. It's a decision process. But once the decision process happens, the proof then, the proof is in your and my willingness to share in whom we believe. Not always easy, but that's kind of the proof text. That's the fruits. You know, the devil works extremely hard, extremely intelligently to make any hope that we might have a salvation not only seem complex, but frankly, to seem impossible. He's quick to remind you and me of every shortcoming we have had. He he amuses himself by finding ways to cause you to recall the great sins and the many failures in our lives. And hear me, especially those sins and mistakes that you and I have not forgiven ourselves for, even though we've been forgiven by God. The devil is a skilled and crafty manipulator and a liar, and that is all he is. Casting Crowns used this awesome chorus to counterpunch that by saying, but the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. The voice of truth said, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling me, I choose to listen and to believe the voice of truth. Can you hear that song in your head? I want to say to you, if right now you're going through a struggle, if right now you are silently bearing stress and pressure, if this is one of those rocky, hard times for you, you are not alone. The voice of truth says, I will be with you. I will walk beside you. You will only walk in the valley of the shadow of death, not of death, and fear not for I am with you. I will comfort you. Now those are God's words and they're our responsibility. We can represent God in being next to those that have the needs. So if you're going through a rough 
time right now, remember, however rough that is, your salvation is secured by a mental and a decision-making ascent. That is salvation for all eternity. And that supersedes and trumps any temporary challenge that you're going through right now. Choose to listen to the voice of truth. Bow your heads with me for a minute. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for making salvation simple. Lord, I would ask that we never forget the simplicity of salvation and that you call us to come home. May we fearlessly approach you and answer, not because of anything we've done, but because what have you, you have done for us. And now, Father, as we discuss the challenge of facing giants in our lives, as we discuss how we can prepare ourselves to, to receive what you, the blessings that you have for us, we ask that you be with us here now and open our minds and hearts with wisdom in Jesus' name, amen. It is said in life that there is nothing more important than preparation. If you've ever played at any level of sport, you know what I mean. To attain a higher level of sport is repetitive preparation. There is one incredible man who is named John Wooden that is a hero to many. He was a godly man who taught preparation, not just for the sport of basketball, but how it related to life. And some of the greatest Hall of Fame basketball players, one of the greatest players to ever live, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, attributes his life and his life path to this man, to what he learned from this man. Now, he may not be a Christian, but it doesn't matter because he has lived a godly life and John Wooden helped to nurture that mentality. But I want you to hear some of the statements that are made by people about preparation. Alexander Graham Bell said, before anything else, preparation is the key to success. Colin Powell said, there are no secrets to success. It's the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. And that indicates that you never give up when you fail. You continue and chalk that up as part of a process. Preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. Benjamin Franklin, the great inventor said, the great leader said, by failing to prepare, this is probably the most familiar, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. I was in 10th grade at Tacoma Academy. Yay. At Tacoma Academy. There might be a few of us. Thank you, Andy, Lisa. Um, and I shared this story with my family like a week ago. And I had, uh, I had an algebra teacher named uh, Mr. Hat, Bob Hat. And he was a very stoic, quiet man. And I kid you not, he walked like this, looked like that, not a whole lot of life in the actions, but he was a phenomenal teacher. He was a hard teacher. And we were coming to our very first test in that class, and he said to us, now many of you might want to bow your heads and have a prayer before we begin this test. But just remember, God can't bring to your mind those things that you haven't studied. That was a little deflating, but it was accurate. There are giants that we face, and sometimes we have to recognize that to address those giants, we need to make Preparation. The movie Facing the Giants is one of my all-time favorites. 
It was a movie made on a shoestring budget of $100,000. It was made by a specific church and their members. I'm looking at our actors right here. That movie brought in $10.8 million. I saw it in a regular theater, so it made it that far. And that's still one of the most watched Christian movies by the Kendrick brothers that they've ever made. Now, it's a few years old now, but it's one of my favorite movies because there are so many lessons taught on so many levels, and they resonate with me. It's the story of a high school football coach named Grant Taylor. Grant's a God-fearing man who's struggling at his job as being a football coach. He's struggling with his finances and making ends meet at home. Uh, And and he's a husband with a wife. He's struggling with his abilities to become a father. It's just not happening. And finally, and humorously, he struggles throughout most of the whole movie with a car that just doesn't want to run. As a coach, Grant Taylor is unable to motivate his football team to play at their highest level frankly, to believe in in themselves that they have more to give than what they're giving. And through the first couple of games, his team loses badly. And in fact, the players become completely dejected and even more unmotivated. Coach Taylor struggles with God over this. He has Jacob moments. He wonders if he is in fact cut out to be the coach for this job And then he wonders, what's the point of it all? Trying to teach kids that don't want to be taught. Soon, he even begins to hear rumblings from other parents that his job might be in jeopardy, that people are calling for him to be thrown out to get somebody else. But in the midst of all his worry, in the midst of the giant that he is facing in his life, and at just the right time, you catch that? That was a little throwback to this week's lesson study. At just the right time, he gets a special visit to his office from someone that shares God's wisdom in a way that causes Coach Taylor to begin to see his calling through a completely different lens. And Marcus, or Carrie Ann, if we can run this short video. Mr. Bridges? Revelation chapter 3 says, We serve a God that opens doors that no one can shut, and he shuts doors that no one can open. He says, Behold, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have a little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Coach Taylor, the Lord is not through with you yet you still have an open door here. And until the Lord moves you, you're to bloom right where you're planted. I just felt led to come and tell you that today. Mr. Bridges. You believe God told you to come tell me that? I do. I admit to you I have been struggling. But I've also been praying. I just don't see him at work here. Grant, I heard a story about two farmers who desperately needed rain. And both of them prayed for rain. But only one of them went out and prepared his fields to receive it. Which one do you think trusted God to send the rain? Well, the one who prepared his fields for it. Which one are you? God will send the rain when he's ready. You need to prepare your field to receive it. The 
are pretty powerful words, aren't they? Which one are we? Are we the one that is just praying for the Lord to do something in our lives? Or are we the ones that are preparing ourselves to receive what he's wanting to do in our lives? In the movie, Coach Taylor begins to recognize that he's been allowing the boys to approach football from a very temporal or short-lived point of view, the point of view of wins and losses rather than something so much more. Through dedicated study of God's word for direction and the preparation of these young men on and off the field, the coach determines one thing, that he's going to teach his players that football, like everything else in life, is just a vehicle by which to bring God glory, win or lose. And once he gets a buy-in from his team, everything begins to change. I would just like to submit to you that there's really two ways to prepare for rain, for God's rain, for when God is going to give us what it is that we need to have. There's only two ways really to prepare. And the first one is soul searching. And the second one is soul reaching. But soul searching is a very personal thing. That's what we do for ourselves. That's, that's a dedicated time between us and God. And the question for us would be, are you and I preparing the soil of our lives for more than just the reward of a cash crop yield for a given year? Are you and I putting our best efforts in school only to get a piece of sheepskin? Are we working only for the payday that will come at the end of the two-week two period? Is our mentality about money and possessions aligned with the reality that one day all of it won't mean a thing? Preparation requires training. Where do we go to be prepared to train for the most important part of our future, which is yet to come? You know, this week I was on Facebook and I happened to see Hailu and New Begin and Sean. And I don't know if any of you guys are their friends, but you happen to see them in their outfits. They had bright yellow vests on and all these cats were riding a hundred miles in our area. In fact, I think I heard today it was 99 point, what was it, Hailu? Yeah, and that <clears throat> 0.15 mile made all the difference. A hundred miles they rode in a day. Now, I can only imagine, have you ever seen a cowboy walk? All right, no, never mind. It was difficult. I can only imagine what life was like the next two days. But for them to be able to ride 100 miles together, and there were eight of you, as I recall, that took preparation. That took forethought. That took you getting yourselves prepared physically, having your bike prepared and ready physically. And then I also noticed as I went through yours and Sean's pictures that you had cheering teams. You had people that met you at some ridiculous hour in the morning to cheer you off as you went, and they were there with you during the ride to give you whatever sustenance they, they did, and they were there at the end of the ride when you finished. There's a lot of preparation that went into that. That doesn't just happen. Primarily, preparation begins in our minds, even before it begins in our bodies. Once we decide that we're going to go all in for the glory of God, then we're going someplace. We're going to the place. We put it all on the line. But what would that look like? How many of us have actually decided, I am going to prepare all out, all out, because I want to receive that rain? Take a minute. 
and think about how you might change your life by changing your approach when you realize that every single interaction that you have with anyone else at any time of your day, work or play, reflects your faith and your relationship to God. You know, we tend to compartmentalize, and in some ways we have to, to some degree. But we can always represent God no matter what we're doing if our character traits include kindness and forethought and deference. Those are ways we can... I remember years ago we had a conversation, Andy, we're in the basement of my room and, and Grimaldo's chiding you for being a, an attorney, right? How are you going to represent those guys that are guilty of sin, you know? They need you just as much as anybody else. And the way you do it is in integrity. You don't judge. God judges. But we are to be judged by how we interact with other people. So whether you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a teacher, whatever it is that you are doing, how we interact and carry ourselves to people is a direct reflection of our relationship with God. And it might be, as you've heard many times before, that you and that image may be the only God that anyone ever sees. Or you might be the image that somebody sees at the crucible moment of their lives. You follow me? This whole quarter, been an incredibly interesting lesson study about crucible moments. As we learned today, are we patient? Do we show our patience? What if you've trained yourself to pause for just a split second before interacting or responding to someone else and you kept this reality in mind? Sometimes we're quick to respond, aren't we? Sometimes our interactions with other people are while they're talking, we're not listening, but we're already thinking of what we're going to say as a rebuttal. Right? Anybody? No, not, not here. Guys, above all else, Jesus was a listener. And he already knew the essence of what everybody was going to talk about. Why? Because he was the creator. And he knew what happened and what was lost as a result of sin. The old saying that you probably learned when you were just a child, two eyes, two ears, one mouth. There's a powerful lesson to be learned there. What if we paused and stopped and took things in before we responded? How often do we take the compassion of God with us during our daily activities and our interactions? This is not a compassionate world we live in. This is far less so than at any time in my life. Far, far less so. This is a society, a cultural society, that first of all challenge, is challenged by the whole concept of the value of life to begin with. Respect. What's that? I will tell you, it's different, it's changed. And by and large, because there are so many that have not been raised in an environment where respect was taught, was learned, was shown, received, and modeled. It's not there. How can it be? There were no examples. Two eyes, two ears, one mouth. Do we give God, God the glory for everything that we do? Or do we do that only when it's convenient and frankly benefits us and paints us in a good life, in a good light, when it draws attention to us? Do we all approach the many responsibilities and facets of each day just to get by or do we actually have the presence of mind to see everything we do as having a potential spiritual significance 
or consequence in our lives and in the lives of those that we're interacting with? That's a big question. They're difficult questions because they get to the heart of why we are preparing for rain. Just remember, the rain we're waiting on and we're preparing for, the soil we're trying to till to make as strong as it can be is not only for us, but it's for its effect that can be seen by many who interact with us. Now, how would you feel if you found out one day that, and I believe he does, that God has a calendar of divine appointments for all of us? How'd you feel if you found out that he had a calendar of divine appointments for all of us, scheduled specifically for you, because you're the only one that could have that effect on the person that you're interacting with? But he had to cancel that appointment because you weren't adequately attuned to his voice or willing to step outside of your comfort zone or willing to show humility or willing to show care or willing to show deference. <clears throat> you know, I do believe that, that all we need to do is make that mental ascent as to who God is, recognize our sinful condition, claim him as our savior and that we will be saved, I believe that. But I also believe that when we get to heaven for those thousand years, there's gonna be a really hard time too. And that hard time is that God will show us all the whys in our road that we took, all of the paths that were different, that strayed from the one he had for us. Now, ultimately, we got to our goal. But what will it be like when he shows us the many divine appointments that we had, and we'll remember them, and that we were not ready, and the effect that it might have had on someone else, positive or negative. That's hard. That's hard. But that responsibility is what we bear. When we decide to call ourselves Christians, we're not just Christians when it's convenient. We're Christians 24 seven, sinful, as the day is long, like filthy rags, as Paul says, but still searching for the heart of God. So I would just say for all of us, be cognizant, be patient, be quick to bite your tongue and not to speak. Be willing to listen and ask God for the wisdom to discern what you're hearing so that you'll know how to respond in a way that would reflect his character. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I know that in the midst of the storms of our lives, sometimes as captains of our ship, we have to take charge and make hard decisions. And those don't always come with the warm fuzzies. I know that's true for all of us. But yet, that doesn't change how we can still approach people in our character with kindness and compassion, even through difficulties. And also, there are some people that tend to live in storms of their own making. Struck a chord with Scott over there. There are people that like there to be a lot of activity and for things to be whipped up because there's a lot of energy, but some of that energy is negative. And, and some people can cause these challenges unnecessarily. We need God to quell those impulses that we have in our lives. Now, using the farmer analogy that we saw in that video, remember this. The ultimate purpose of preparing your field and preparing your soil is because it's often the quality of that soil that determines the harvest even more so than the quality of the seed. While preparation is a process, it's so much healthier than sitting idly. God will send the rain and he's gonna send it at a time of his choosing. And you and I will want our fields to be prepared to be ready to receive it when it does come. 
In short, we need to, uh, we need to always be tending our garden. 1 Peter 1.13 says, and thank you so much, Nathan, for reading those this morning. Therefore, preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded, that means being able to focus and to be pensive. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. There is preparation for soul searching, and then there is preparation for soul reaching. And just in short, soul reaching, for example, here at CMC, we say and have said for many years that we are a church for all people. Remember the four hands that we have on the bulletin? That wonderful creation that that John Williams put together. It's a beautiful statement, but is it a true statement? Are we a church for all people? Are we a church whose motto and focus is we will join hands with you to become mature followers of Jesus? Who is the you? Everybody. Who is the we? All of us. That is what we're willing to do. We have to be willing to prepare ourselves to be soul reachers. What does that mean? We need to continue to pray for God's help to prepare us to receive others and draw people to him in creative and warm ways to the cross. Now, we just spent a significant chunk of money in the last three years to redo some significantly needed issues at our church. We have got a good sound system. We've got a different church. We've got far better acoustics. We have a stage. We have lots of abilities to appeal to people. Aesthetically, we look good. But what good is that if we're not appealing to the people? Sometimes we get very comfortable in the way we do things. Doesn't mean that's bad, but sometimes we get so comfortable that we don't recognize that the way that we do things is not reaching new people. Sometimes we get comfortable and satisfied that the way we do things is just maintaining the status quo. We are not called to maintain the status quo. We are called to blow open the doors and make everyone around us recognize this is a place of peace, of respite, of hope. This is Christ's home. And we deport ourselves in such a way that people don't have reservation to enter into our doors. That's how we must be. We get comfortable. Comfortable's good on a Saturday night at home after nine o'clock in your jammies with your popcorn. But as a ministry... We need to be uncomfortable. As a people of ministry, we need to be willing to try new things that might very well step on our toes if we can show that as a result of those efforts, more people are interested and are coming to hear the word. That's called preparation. In doing things new ways, We need to make Jesus more attractive to people. And we must take risks to do so. Those are hard. People push back against that all the time. I've done it. But we must never forget, and here's the hard part. We like our comfortable framework, but we can never forget that God does not work within our framework. Not of our thinking anyway, He lives outside the boxes. There are many things that are simply not normal in regards to how God works. Think about it. He's the God that turns water into wine. He calls fire to come out from the sky. He parts a sea to save his people and then closes it 
against their enemies. He causes a donkey to speak and to be heard. He saved Daniel and his faithful friends from a fiery furnace. He fed a multitude of people with one little boy's offering of five loaves and two fishes. He causes the sun to stand still. He raises the dead. This is not a God that lives within our box. Is there anything God can't do if he wishes it? Nothing. Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So back to our little story. Many things had taken place during that football year at Shiloh Christian Academy football. The Holy Spirit had brought about revival through the entire student body and also, and more importantly, to the football team through the example, the teaching, and the ministry of Coach Taylor. Through some miracle, they were allowed into the playoffs where they win and they get a chance to match themselves up against a powerhouse, a three-time champion, Richland Giants in the state championship. The Giants team has three times the players on their football team than Coach Taylor has. They're all bigger, stronger, faster. It's seemingly an impossible matchup. But as the result of a late fourth quarter fumble and incredible courage played throughout the game, Shiloh has one unexpected chance still to win. And that requires the coach to abandon any logic or reason. And in his play calling, he instead prepares for rain. The Eagles have got a shot at the football game. Seconds, Grant. We've got time for a Hail Mary. No, no, the defense is too strong for the pass. No, we can't run it. That's our only option. You gotta kick it, man. David. I need a 51 yard field goal. Coach, I can't kick that far. David, they've been stopping the run of the pass all night. You're my best option. Coach, the farthest I've ever kicked is a 39 yarder. There's no way I can kick a 51 yard field goal. I believe you can. Your job is to do the best you can and leave the results up to God. I need you on that field. Our field goal unit. Grant, we've got to throw it. He can't kick it from there. It's too far. No, it's not. What are you doing? I'm preparing for rain. I don't understand this, but with two seconds left on the clock, Coach Grant Taylor and the Shallow Eagles are putting the game in the hands of a 145-pound backup kicker. This is not a good move on Grant Taylor's part. He even has to kick into the wind. He's not ready, Granny. Don't think he can do it. I don't have any more timeouts. Call a timeout, Bobby Lee. This kid can't kick that far. Call that timeout. Call a timeout anyway, and let's ice him. Hey, come here. David, you telling yourself you're going to miss this kick. Coach, it's too far. Listen to me. Do you think God could help you make this kick? Do you believe it, David? Yeah, if he wants to. So do I. But you have got to give me your best and leave the rest up to him. Will you do that for me? David, whether you make this field goal or not, we're going to praise him. But don't you walk off this field having done any less than your best.
down at 23 to take the state title for the first time in their history. It's incredible. It's absolutely unbelievable. You are state champion. You are state champion. to say. David Childers. Don't you ever let anyone tell you that you're under par, second rate, or inferior. I just watched God do a miracle through you. I saw a field of giants, 85 of them to be exact, fall in defeat. Now you tell me what's impossible with God. Nothing, coach. Zach, I just watched you and the offense do what they said could not be done. Now you tell me what's impossible with God. Nothing good. Bra, how about it? You built that stone wall, didn't you? And it stood. Now you tell me what's impossible with God. Nothing, coach. How about it, Scott? What's impossible with God? Nothing. Are you sure? Because those giants are big. They got numbers three to one. Are you sure there's nothing impossible with God? I'm sure, coach. How about it, Nathan? What's impossible with God? Nothing, Coach. Jonathan? Nothing. Are you positive? Positive, Coach. So am I. So am I. God can do whatever He wants to do, however He wants to do it. And He chooses to work in our lives because He loves us, because He's good. Hope today is a milestone for what He can do for the rest of your life if you trust Him. And we spend some time thanking Him. So CMC family, what is impossible for God? Do you mean it? If God can do anything, then we need to let him do everything he wants to do. We need to prepare our soil for the change that he's going to bring us. You know, it's been nine months that we've been without a head pastor. Nine months. And I have watched week by week with COVID, all these things we've gone through, how difficult it has been to get back to church. Church has changed. It will always be changed some way or another as a result of what we've gone through. Thank God for some of you leaders of this church that are keeping it together and keeping it strong and for the ministers that have come up front and given us you know, the word from the Lord. But... We're in a time of preparation. We need to continue to prepare ourselves and our soil to receive the pastor that God is going to send to us. And he'll do it in his time when he wants to. In the meantime, I'm so pleased to watch our numbers continue to grow just a smidge week after week. We need to work at that. That's an effort that needs to be undertaken by all of us. But we do it in love. We do it in the character of God. My prayer and my encouragement to each one of you is that in the meantime, until God sends us our pastor, that we continue together to cultivate our own soil, to make it fertile, so that when we do receive the leader of God's choosing. There'll be a great yield during the harvest. May we support the pastor, whoever he or she is, in all ways that would bring glory to God and salt and light to our families and to our community. May God bless our church as we continue to face the giants.
please stand with us as we sing our closing song, Make Me a Servant. God bless you and keep you. May God have his countenance to shine upon you and to bring you peace. May God grow you closer to his side each and every day. May the ills and the harms of this world not touch you. May God's promises always encourage you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.